a look at the bottom of page 1060, completely different law. And this is, it's the last word on page 1060. And it says like this, Ki siktsar ketzircha b'sodecha, when you harvest your field, v'shachachta omer basodeh, you forget an omer, you forget a sheev, you forget a bundle in the field, lo sashuv l'kachto, you're not allowed to go back and retrieve it. This is page 1062. Lager layasam v'la'amana iya, you must leave it for the convert, the widow, or the orphan, Generally, the convert is put into the same category because often converts do not have any sort of infrastructure of support, and often they were poor, uh, like the story of Rus, and certainly the widow and the orphan, and you must leave it in the field for them. In other words, you're out in the field, and you've got a bundle of wheat in the field, and then they, they did it in, they did the, the, the gathering in the field, was done in stages. First you harvest the field, then you go back to the field, you start making bundles, then you go back and you bring in all the bundles. So that's why sometimes you walk past the farm and you look out on the field, you see bundles all over the field. So the Torah says, hold, hold the question for you a minute. So the Torah says that, um, that a, a, if you're gathering in your bundles and you forget your bundles, and there's a halachic line where it's considered forgotten. It Forgotten means you walked past it. Gathering in the bundles, you walk past it to the extent that you cannot reach back and, and, and reach it. Uh, and and, and you, for, you had forgotten it, you must not take it, you must leave it for the poor people. The Torah then continues over here with various other uh, uh, gifts, what's called in halacha, matnos aniyim, the gifts for the poor. When you're harvesting your crop, if you drop some of the, some of the stalks of wheat fall, depending on how many fall out of your hand and how they fall, you're not allowed to take them, you have to leave them for the field. In the field, the poor people come to the field and they gather around and at the harvest, they follow the harvesters and they pick up and talk about it in a society where people were literally starving for bread. There's something called peya, which is what you have to leave at the corner of your field. There's a certain section that you're not allowed to harvest, that you're not allowed to harvest it at all, and you have to leave that section for the poor people. All these categories of gifts for the poor are called matnos aniyim, the gifts for the poor. Now, what's underlying this? What's the underlying idea? So the commentaries point out like this. In, when it comes to the laws of charity, <clears throat> the most important thing when it comes to the laws of charity is what? Different, it's to maintain the dignity of the poor man. It's bad enough that a guy's got to ask for a handout. It's embarrassing to ask for a handout. The only thing worse than asking for a handout is being humiliated when you're getting that handout. It's very humiliating. A guy gives you the money, a guy throws you the money. You're better off not giving a poor person money than giving it to him in a way that's insulting. It's bad enough that he's got to ask for the money. So the Torah comes along, and the Torah says, you know what? Watch this. You're going to go out to your field. You're, you know, you're a farmer. You own, you own a few acres, and you got your fields over there. And there are a bunch of poor guys that are standing along the field. And one of them says to you, hey, Justin, when do we start? And Justin looks at him, what do you mean, we? What do you mean, we, guys? You know, hey, what time are we starting the harvest today? We, we you know, what, what, who invited you? The answer is the Torah invited them. You have a right to the field, and they have as much of a right to their produce in that field as you do to your produce. The Torah has given it to them. I'm not taking anything from you. I'm not taking anything from you. I don't owe you anything. The Torah gave this to me, and you've got an obligation to leave it for them. And that helps maintain the dignity of the poor people. The poor man goes, and the poor man feels that you have a right to the field. You happen to be blessed, and you had the money to buy a field, or you inherited a field. I also have rights in your field. I don't even have to ask you permission to go into your field. You're not allowed to stop the poor people from following you when your harvesters are cutting it down. That maintains the dignity. It's bad enough I got to go to your field and I got to go pick out the, the, the fallen grain. The Torah does it in a way that maintains the dignity. That's the, that's the most important part of the mitzvah. You know, there's an organization in Israel. There are many organizations, many, many stuck organizations. Every Jew is a Rambam says, we never found a Jewish city that did not have a charity relief fund. There's no such thing. Jewish city is no such thing. There's always charity relief funds. So there's one organization, I'll tell you a beautiful story, there's an organization that gives out chickens for Shabbos. In most communities, it's a Shabbos, it's Shabbos relief. A poor man should at least have Shabbos to enjoy. So there's an organization that gives out chickens in Israel. I think they give out about 750 cases of chickens a week. Now, the way they do it to help the poor man maintain his dignity is they take, let's say, a case of chickens costs uh, 600 shekels, 
they sell it for 80 shekels. They have a list of poor people, they sell it for 80 shekels. Now, what does that do? By allowing the man to pay, by allowing the man to pay, he would rather pay 80 shekels than get it for free. Because by allowing him to pay, and he's Jewish, so all he thinks is, I got a killer of a bargain here. Right? He doesn't think to himself, he doesn't think to himself that this is, you know, this is obviously way too low to be a bargain that's a giveaway. He thinks to himself, listen, I happen to be lucky. I got on listen, I'm paying for it. So you give him the opportunity to pay for it. But more than that, they give them a choice of the hechsher that they want. They call the poor people, they give them a choice. Do you want badats, or do you want shavers, or do you want Reuben? Which chickens do you want? And then after they buy these 80 shekel, 80 shekel for, per case chickens, then they have a customer service call. They call them up and say, were you satisfied? Were your chickens fresh? Were everything else? All for the purpose of the guy not feeling that he's getting given a handout. And usually you, should, you can imagine that it's the people who pay the least who have the most complaints. <laughs> that's certainly true. <laughs> but that's the way to maintain, to maintain. That's the priority. And therefore the Torah is showing you, you know how important Sadaka is? That these poor people come in your field. They have the right to be in the field. That takes away that need for me to feel humiliated that I'm getting a pure handout because there's very little that's as humiliating. There was a case in England, I'll get to what I say, Josh, there was a case in England, a guy, they, they had a, a Shabbos relief fund in England. And so this guy goes to a very wealthy man in England. It's one of these Shabbos organizations. They go, they knock on the door, a very wealthy man. And he says, listen, you know, we're, we're you know, can you help us out for our Shabbos, our, our Shabbos relief fund? So the guy says, look, I'll give you a thousand pounds sterling. But I only have one condition. I'd like to see the list of the people that you're distributing to. Yes, I'm sorry, we have a policy. We don't, for the dignity of the poor people, we don't, we don't reveal their names. So he says, you know what, I'll give you 2,500 pounds. But for 2,500 pounds, I think I'm entitled to see the names of the people. The guy says, I'm sorry, we don't do this. He goes, look, I'll give you 10,000 pounds. I'll match your weekly budget. I'll match your weekly budget. But I think for 10,000 pounds, I'm entitled to see where my money's going to. So the guy says to him, you can give us a million pounds. We will never disclose any of the names of the people on our list. We are going to protect their dignity. The guy says, good, that's what I wanted to hear. You see, I've lost all my money in the market, and I myself was going to contact you for help, but I was just embarrassed. I didn't know how discreet you were. Now that I see how discreet you are, please add me to your list. That's the, that's the, 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 the essential mitzvah of tzedakah is maintain the dignity. That's what the Torah teaches us here. Justin, what are we going to ask? Even that portion of your field are allowing uh, the Torah to it is. It is. You're fulfilling the mitzvah tzedakah like anything else. It's a command. Anytime I'm commanded to do something, the fact that I'm commanded doesn't mean I don't get credit for doing it. Yeah, you fulfilled the mitzvah of tzedakah, a very big mitzvah. And, and remember, there's a tremendous, tremendous temptation to play around with it or figure out a way that, you know, maybe I'll work around it and maybe this doesn't really count. And it, all sorts of shtick. We're talking about money over here. And that's why in the, earlier in the Torah, in, I think it's in Parshas, uh, either in Kedoshim or in Mishpatim, I don't remember where, where the Torah also mentions the gifts for the poor. And right after, the very next passage, the Torah says, don't steal. And the commentaries say, why do they juxtapose those two, don't steal, with the gifts of the poor? Because a very strong temptation when it comes to the gifts of the poor to pull shtick. Because in our minds, we're thinking to ourselves, listen, I worked. I worked. Why should I give this guy the hand? Okay, the Torah says to do it. Let's see if I can figure out a way. You know, maybe there's a loophole here. Maybe there's a, I could, I could whitewash something over here. And the Torah knows that that's human nature because our money means a lot to us. Therefore, the Torah says don't do it. So how much of your land do you set aside? You actually set aside uh, by, by, there's Torah law and rabbinic law. Rabbinic law says that for the payah, you set aside one-fiftieth of your land. One-fiftieth of your land. Oh, it depends how big your it depends it depends how big your field is. Number one, number two. Remember, the poor people go from field to field. You're talking about in a farm in a farm. Here they, they, they have like an organization or something that. Yeah, and nowadays, yeah, nowadays it's done differently. Nowadays they are, it's all it's all organized because nobody's going to go to the field. Nobody's gathering up stocks of wheat. Bread is subsidized. Kind of like bread is bread. subsidized, but theoretically, in, in times in times of the base, I mean, so they, there were all sorts of things that they give. So the so the, the, the poor people shall say what they eat. That's how Torah rages. The best it. kind of stuff is anonymous, right? Is anonymous, correct. That's the, that's the best stuck as anonymous, and the more anonymous, the highest form of stuck is that you don't know who you're giving it to, and the receiver doesn't know who he got it from. And the way that's done is by giving it to a recognized, legitimate stuck organization, and then they distribute the money so the poor man doesn't know who it came from, and the rich man doesn't know who he's giving it to.